So welcome. Today we're going to talk about uh, seed marketing laws in the context of crop diversity. This is meant so as an introduction to the European um, Union laws and the acquis communautaire, so the legal framework that governs seed marketing. And essentially, the presentation will first look at the general principles of the seed. Uh, marketing uh, laws, and then look at the room that is available for what I coin crop diversity actors and uh, varieties and populations that are a bit less uniform, uh, that those that have found their main space within the general principles. So the EU seed laws basically are uh, made of 12 EU directives. So in EU law, you have two main bodies of law. So different types of laws, if you wish. So one is a regulation. Regulations are directly applicable in different member states, whereas directives need to be transposed. And so basically uh, the entire EU seed marketing acquis is, are comprised of directives. And that is why we say that the, you have 20, you had uh, up until a few months ago, 28 national seeds marketing regime, but now you have 27 national seeds marketing regime because of that national transposition. Uh, there was a proposal uh, to change this entire acquis and to transform it into a regulation in 2013, but the proposal was rejected by the European Parliament and withdrawn by the European Commission. You should also know so that you have in the European decision making mechanism, the two, the legislative power um, is within the European Parliament and the European Council. So the European Parliament is directly elected. The European Council comprises of uh, members of the national uh, government. Okay, so it's indirect representation. And the European Commission is essentially an executive power, so they have the power to uh, oversee the implementation of uh, adopted legislation, but they also have the right of initiative, so that's why the proposals come from them. And now today, as we speak, so in 2021, uh, uh, the European Commission has by being pushed by the European Council to do so, uh, has or commissioned a study uh, on options to look out for the reform of the seeds marketing regimes. Okay, the focus is on land races and sale to home gardeners, but it also looks at uh, different issues that are experienced by competent national authorities and also more industrial players. For so the EU seed laws. Um, are essentially, so the goals and the rationale, so their existence uh, is uh, painted across three main elements. So it's about the quality of seeds, the identity of seeds, and also a, a productivity mindset that is quite apparent when you actually read the preambles of the different directives. And the way I'm going to talk about the content of these directives today is about the three uh, main areas where that are regulated by these seed marketing rules. Okay, so you either have a, a variety or a supplier registration, but the principle that is common to all of the directive is that you have a registration that needs to be made prior to the marketing of seeds whether that's a variety or a supplier, then in each directive, you have seed production rules. So this is not about variety registration, but seed production. And then you have labeling and packaging rules. And this color scheme will accompany us throughout the presentation. Okay, so the 12 directives at EU level, I'm gonna quickly present them in a historical context. So. Most of them started, so there was a first wave in the 1960s and 70s at EU level, huh? not at national level. National level, it started earlier in certain states. But in the, at the EU level, the first uh, directives have appeared in the 1960s and the 1970s. So they're all regulating different crop species. And then we're going to see afterwards, it's also within the species, you have a specific genera. But so the, 
fodder seeds, potato seeds, vine, cereal, beet seed, oil and fiber uh, seeds, and vegetable seeds have all seen um, a regime uh, on their marketing be adopted at European level. And you have so a different directive that basically governs uh, the variety registration part of the three main areas of action of the directives for fodder, potato, cereal, beet seed, and oil and fiber, which is this common catalog for agricultural species. Whereas for vegetables, the common catalog is integrated into the directive, which also governs seed production and labeling rules. Then another wave comes in the 1990s, where we also see rules being adopted for fruits, ornamentals, and forest reproductive material. Okay. Then in the year 2000, so this, this in the decade from 2000 to 2010, these directives are always obviously amended and the authorities uh, considered that they were amended so much that they needed a recast, uh, so a recodification, because it was getting a bit too complicated to actually assess uh, which rules were applicable on the day you were actually opening up the directive. So there has been a big recast. So when you're actually looking for the a directive, if you want to look at the rules that govern the marketing of potato seeds, you, you should not look for Directive 66 slash 403, but you should look for Directive 2002 slash 56 because it has been recast and the number has changed. For those where the number of the directive has not changed in this uh, slide, you can go look at the old numerotation. Okay. And in 2008, we also saw a new body of plant material being um, regulated, which is vegetable seeds other than seeds. Okay. Then uh, the latest big change that has happened, uh, so after the year 2010, uh, except from the reform, which obviously is not applicable today, uh, is the organic regulation, okay? The regulation that governs organic production. So adopted um, in 2018 and will enter into force on the 1st of January of next year. Uh, and within that framework, so I'm gonna to get to that at the end of this presentation, but there's also going to be a commission regulation this time, not a council and parliament regulation, but a commission regulation, which is essentially a delegated act, what we call in the jargon, on the notification of organic heterogeneous material. Okay, so this is basically the landscape in which I'm gonna to talk to you about the three principles, so the main principles that govern, uh, that, that are uh, established by the EU seed marketing rules. So the first is quite uh, famous for most of you. So the principle is that you need to register a variety and that needs to be tested under official control in order to be able to market the seed of that variety. I give you an example here from uh, the, the Common Catalogue of Agricultural Species Directive, but you'll find it in very similar uh, forms in all the directives. The concept of that variety, you should know, is not defined in the seed marketing legislation, but it is defined in the regulation that establishes the Community Plant Variety Office. So it's defined in a text that basically grants intellectual property rights over seeds, okay? Uh, the principle here in seed marketing laws is that in order to be able to sell the seeds of a particular variety, it needs to be registered. And for that registration to happen, you need to show that your variety is distinguishable from a variety that is common knowledge. Common knowledge uh, being defined by the EU law as something that has been registered before, not necessarily uh, from distinguishable from foreign material or from a land race that has never seen 
uh, formal uh, variety registration. You also need to show that your variety is uniform in the expression of its characteristics, and you need to show that it is stable throughout propagation. And these protocols, so for each species, mostly, you have protocols that are called DUS protocols, so distinguish um, distinctiveness, uh, uniformity and stability protocols. They are established by the Community Plant Variety Office, which, as I just told you before, is an intellectual property rights body. It's not a seed marketing body. So the two systems are, in essence, completely different because they do not govern uh, the same, they do not serve the same purpose. So the EU seed marketing laws is about market access, whereas the CPVO system, so the Community Plant Variety Office and intellectual property rights are about granting a temporary monopoly on the use of a variety and giving exclusive rights to a breeder. But the two systems are extremely intertwined and very, very close to each other. Okay. The thing that distinguishes uh, seed marketing laws from also this plant variety right system is that for especially, so this is true for cereals, species and for industrial shikari and vegetable seeds, you also need to prove that the variety is has so a value for cultivation and use. Okay, you in order to be able to sell the seeds of a variety, in order you need to register that variety, and you need to show the US and BCU. These protocols so are enacted by the national authorities, and they they're basically again so you send samples to the authorities. The authorities themselves assess uh, the value of these varieties for the cultivation and use by comparing them to other registered varieties that are basically have made their way into the common catalog in their production qualities. Okay, the principle is that you need to do this, so you need to register a variety into a national catalog and the EU system, basically the building of an EU common seed market means that all member states catalogs are in an equal footing. So once you get into a national catalog that equals being at the EU uh, level and you enter the common catalog of the European Union. Uh, the, um, another consequence of having <laughs> this variety registration is that you need to maintain the registered variety and the maintenance obligations so it depend on the technical specificities of the species but they're very similar throughout the EU seed directives. Another uh, system of pre-marketing registration that exists in certain very limited uh, number of species and directives uh, de facto, is the supplier registration. So this exists, for instance, in the fruit directive, especially at the beginning. So the first draft, so the first regime in the 1990s, it only relied on mandatory supplier registration. You didn't necessarily have a variety registration at the time. But now in fruit, uh, you also have this hybrid system, uh, for lack of a better word, that you also need to register uh, a variety, okay? But it's not done uh, through the aforementioned DUS and VCU protocols. It's done through an official description or an officially recognized description. So it's a bit smoother, especially uh, this little derogation, if you wish, or condition uh, for entering the variety register or variety list for food propagating material. Where, whereby if you, if you show that uh, a variety has been marketed before the 30th of September, 2012, then it, will, like, it can make its way into the register much more smoothly, okay? Otherwise supplier registration also exists. So for, uh, for example, for vegetable propagating material other than seeds, but it is honestly, it's the exception to the rule, the rule remaining variety registration under official control. Second big uh, chunk of rules that come from the EU seed marketing regime is relates to seed production. So we're not in variety or supply registration, we're at the level of seed production. And here the idea is that the marketing directives exist in order to ensure that farmers and users of seed gets 
access to seeds of high quality. So each directive, so I'm giving you an example here from the vegetable directives, vegetable seed directives in their annex, you have minimum quality criteria and conditions that need to be satisfied by, satisfied by the seed. So it's usually humidity rates, purity, germination rates, etc. The second big chunk of rules that exists uh, with regards to the production of seeds, there, it's not just merely about quality, it's also about ensuring the identity and the purity of the seed that has been put on the market. And this is where seed lot certification comes into play. Again, we're under an official control mechanism. So uh, it is done by public authorities that come and that check the identity, quality and purity of the seed lots themselves prior to the marketing at different stages. So it's in the field, at harvest, on lots. And it is accompanied by quite restrictive rules. So you have high, high, very high purity levels and quite restrictive. So distances to be um, complied with, with regards to um, pollina pollinization sources. So the distances between neighboring plants, et cetera, as you see here uh, from the directive from the vegetable seeds, they're all listed according to the crop species in each directive where you actually have certification. So this is where I come. So the mandatory uh, seed lot certification is uh, established in the directives that regulate cereal seeds, fruits, and vegetables. You have certain exceptions that are granted. So for fruit, even though uh, seeds certification is mandatory. You can also uh, market something called CAC material where you have specific rules and restrictive rules on this, but you do not need to uh, have um, certified seeds. For vegetables, seeds, the in theory, obviously, when you read the directive itself, uh, seed lot certification is mandatory, but you have the option to be to sell standard seeds where the purity and identity control is done post marketing and what you've seen and I guess most of you actually know this uh, that uh, standard seed has become quite uh, the norm, especially in certain uh, vegetable seed markets. And in other directives, seed lot certification is actually optional or doesn't even exist. So this is the case for vine, where you have only standard propagating material, much like standard vegetable seed. For vegetable propagating material and seed, for ornamentals and for forest reproductive material, you do not have a certification. Okay. So then a uh, third uh, big uh, area where EU seed marketing rules come into play is that the re relates to the labeling and packaging to be used when you market seeds. So the first principle is that you need to market seeds in sealed packages. So that, that needs the packages need to be sealed officially or under official supervision. They cannot be opened without damaging the system or leaving evidence of tampering. This is the principle. So it is called an official seal when you have that. So this is an example from the fodder uh, seed directive. So the seed, commercial seed, uh, basic certified or commercial seed can only be marketed in sufficiently homogene homogeneous lots in sealed packages that bear then the second part, a label. Okay, the, you have two types of labels, if you wish. The, so the principle remaining that you need an official label with minimum information uh, that is required and dimensions, all listed in the annexes of each directive per crop species. And the derogation, so the exception to the rule being uh, the supplier's label, so not the official label, but have, allowing you to have a supplier's label in small packages in certain species. So this opportunity only exists in certain directives, not in all of them. And again, even if you're using a supplier's label, you will find in each, so in the annexes that regulate uh, labeling and packaging rules, you will have so uh, information that need that is required and dimensions 
minimum dimensions for official labels, but also for suppliers' labels. Okay, so how does it look like when we put all of this together? Okay, so the idea, so you have three, the three main principles, so pre-marketing registration, seed production rules, and labeling and packaging rules. Pre-marketing registration, you either need to register so a variety based on the US, so this is for vegetables and vine, and or the US and VCU, so distinctiveness, uniformity, stability, plus show value for cultivation and use. So value for cultivation and use being today assessed uh, according to national protocols, the US assessed by EU protocols uh, addicted by the plant breeders rights regime, the US and VCU for agricultural crop species and for shikari, uh, for vegetable industrial shikari only or through an official description or an officially recognized description. This is for fruit pr pr propagating material. Another uh, pre-marketing registration mechanism is the supplier registration, which exists for fruits, ornamentals, forest reproductive material, vegetable propagating material other than seed. When you will look at seed production rules, so you have quality standards, which is about purity and germination, all regulated species, have quality standards, they differ, uh, but they're quite similar. And you, you would be actually surprised to know that, you know, the germination rates are sometimes not that high in uh, certain directives. And then you have the um, higher restrictive uh, purity in uh, identity check, which is the seed, certif seed lot certification mechanism which is either mandatory, so for cereals, but also so for vegetables and fruit material, even though it is, it is what, what I would call a light mandatory regime because you have exceptions to the rule that can be used, especially for crop diversity actors. So which is the standard vegetable seed regime and the fruit crack material uh, marketing regime. Or you have uh, regimes where certification is optional like vine or that it absolutely doesn't exist in others. And then in all EU seed marketing directives, you have labeling and packaging rules that gives you so the rules that you need to follow in order to uh, pose an official seal and use an official label on the package that you want to market. So uh, another way of wrapping it up and seeing it is basically uh, this is not starting from the principles themselves, but starting from the directives. So what do the rules look like when I look at the different directives by species? So for all of these agricultural crops, so this is the family of agricultural crops, for, uh, crops so fodder, potatoes, cereal, beet seed, oil and fiber, you uh, have mandatory variety registration based on the US and VCU mandatory seed lot certification. For vine, mandatory variety registration based only on the US, no VCU, and optional seed lot certification. For vegetables, we are uh, faced with mandatory variety registration based on the US, except for industrial shikari, where uh, it's uh, also VCU. And then mandatory seed lot certification, but in practice, post-marketing uh, control-based standard seed is uh, you can it, it is marketable. For fruits, uh, the principle is this hybrid of supplier registration, but also variety register list based not on the US uh, protocols or VCU protocols, but on an official description or common knowledge or an officially recognized description. And then mandatory seed lot certification, except for CAC material. For ornamentals, forest, and vegetable propagating material other than seeds, the principle is supplier registration or an accreditation, if you wish, and there's no seed lot certification. So they're much smoother regimes, if you wish. So they're less bureaucratic than the rest. Uh, then for the organic production, so the regulation, uh, I'm gonna come to that and speak more in detail about this specific uh, regime at the second part of the presentation, but you should know that it's, we're not talking about a pre-marketing registration, but it's a notification system and there's no uh, seed dot certification. Okay, so these uh, rules will be um, 
decided upon, so in edicted in the dele future delegated act, which will uh, govern the regime of uh, organic heterogeneous material. So for the general principles, so normally you have now uh, an idea of how the things work and the reason why they're uh, made this way. So just, I will uh, remind you of my first slide. So the rationale of these entire directives is about productivity, quality, and information and identity of seeds. Okay, and so the, the problem that crop diversity actors face, and also, and by crop by diversity actors, I do not, do not only mean seed savers, but also organic breeders, uh, farmers who are engaged in participatory plant breeding. So these actors who are not dealing with the kind of varieties that fit into this very specific mindset of the EU seed marketing rules, well, they have trouble navigating this entire uh, regime, which is quite complex and which differs from member state to another and also has a, reaches out to activities which in essence weren't necessarily um, uh, I believe, are not meant to be included in the seed marketing rules. So when I talk for room uh, for crop by diverse diversity within the EU seed marketing rules, we're only talking about derogations, okay? Crop diversity, more diverse, more heterogeneous uh, material and populations are always uh, derogations. Could I please ask everyone to mute themselves because we're hearing some background noise which is quite disturbing thank you so much so the the three um, main um, viewpoints that we take when we talk about room for crop diversity in the e seed marketing rules is first the general derogations that exist the first the scope itself of the eu seed law a key then the derogations that exist on the principle of variety registration, and then derogations that exist on seed lot production and labeling rules. Okay. Then, so again, the same color scheme. So first and foremost, the big uh, uh, principle of the material scope of the directives is that they only apply to regulated species. So they only apply to species that have a significant commercial interest that it makes sense to include them in the common EU seed market, okay? And that means that in each directive, you have an annex. So here I, I'm giving you the list that exists for vegetable seeds. You have an annex that lists the genera and species that are regulated. It means that anything that is not on this list is not subject to the EU seed marketing directives. It sounds grand and it is on certain things, but de facto you have uh, a few non-regulated species that are important. I think in where crop diversity initiatives uh, can play a role and will find uh, a, a larger room to maneuver. So th these non-regulated species um, include aromatic herbs, quinoa, buckwheat, millet, for instance, parsnips, salsify. Lentils, in theory, so uh, are not regulated at EU level, but for instance, and that's where uh, we also say that you're facing 27 different seed marketing regimes in the EU. At national level, sometimes the species that are not regulated at EU level will be regulated at national level, which is the case for lentils, for instance, in France. They're regulated in France at national level, but they won't be regulated uh, in another uh, EU country. So at EU level from the directives, they're not because uh, they're not they have not been considered to be significant enough to be regulated at EU level. And uh, so what does this mean in practice? It means that you do not need to follow the rules of the seed directives doesn't mean that you can actually market completely freely because, for instance, plant health uh, obligations uh, will apply because the, 
the, the, the main criteria for the plant, plant health regulation to apply is not the marketing of seed anymore, but it's the movement of seed. So you, you might have obligations that surround your activities, but you do not need to go through uh, pre-marketing registration, seed lot production rules and labeling rules. Okay. The second biggest uh, idea or principle that exists around the marketing, the material scope of the directive, directives is that it, they only apply to the marketing of seeds, okay? You have different definitions that are given uh, to the concept of seed marketing already within the EU directives themselves. So one, uh, for instance, here you see the one and the fruit directive, it's the sale, holding with a view to sale, offer for sale, any disposal, supply or transfer aimed at commercial exploitation of propagating material or fruit plants to third parties, whether or not for consideration. So this means that it can be uh, for exchange of money. So they cannot, cannot be an exchange for money. That doesn't mean. That doesn't change anything. For another definition comes from the directive that regulates the marketing of vegetable propagating material other than seed. It's the holding available in stock, displaying or offering for sale, selling and or delivering to another person, whatever form, propagating planting material. Okay. But the main definition uh, that is also used in most of the discussions that surround the concept, uh, the, so the, the concept of seed marketing comes from the directives on cereal seeds, fodder, vegetable, potato, beet seed, and oil and fiber seed. And it's this one that you see on screen. And it's quite similar, but a bit different because you actually get a, a bit more information about what they mean about, so the sale, holding with a view to sale, offer for sale, any disposal, supply or transfer, that is aimed at commercial exploitation of seed to third parties, whether or not for consideration. So you have certain examples that give that are given on trade in seed that is not aimed at commercial exploitation of the variety. So for official testing, inspection, for processing, packaging, etc. Conservation activities, research is not necessarily mentioned okay but there is a little paragraph here so the in in the article that says that the conditions for the application of this provision and the def definition of so the marketing can be determined through a delegated act so the, the procedure referred to in article 46 is referred basically refers to the delegation of powers and it also, that delegated act never happened. Huh? So the commission has not adopted uh, a, a more articulate interpretation of seed marketing, which means that at national level, you are left with a wide, quite wide range of interpretations. I'm gonna give you a few examples. So in 2015, the Danish authorities have uh, published instructions for non-commercial use of uh, seeds and there it's quite an interesting read uh, I think it's available online if it's not you can drop me an email and I will uh, forward it to you and it's it is in English not just in Danish and it gives out examples uh, different examples of what commercial use of seed means to, to the Danish authorities and non-commercial use also de facto means. And they define commercial use, so they define seed marketing as the marketing of seed for agricultural and horticultural production, i.e. commercial production. So anything that is not commercial scale will not be subject, according to the Danish authorities reading of the EU directives, they will not be subject to the seed marketing rules. And they give also examples to here, the sale and exchange of seeds for non-commercial use to private individuals will be outside of the scope of the legislation, especially if it's in private or gift shops. But for instance, when you upscale a bit that sale to private individuals, to nurseries or in a horticultural setting, then it will, in the eyes of the Danish law, become a commercial use. But anything that is not scaled up 
at the commercial level will not be subject to the uh, seed marketing regime. So the, you have also um, a different uh, take from the, from the the Dutch administration. So this is not in a, these instructions for commercial use in that have been adopted by Denmark. They're not part of the official, so the, it hasn't been a change of decree. It's really about explaining um, and interpreting existing applicable law. Okay, so there has not been a change uh, of formalized legislation to do this. And in the Netherlands, it's also an administrative practice, I think, because uh, I haven't found it in the official decrees, but it is uh, on their website quite clearly written that they say that no variety registration should be necessary if the yearly turnover for that particular variety and its seeds is less than 500 euro per variety. Okay, so this is the scaling they have in terms of defining the market, the material scope of the directives in the Netherlands. In Austria, the route was taken, it was a much more formalized route. So it's a change of decree. So it's a formalized rule, which by essence make, you know, make the adoption of the rule uh, subject to obviously a democratic <laughs> lawmaking process. Uh, and in the decree, the seeds decree, which is quite uh, thick, it says that the transmission of seeds by farmers or seed users against payment or in kind is allowed if the farmer or the user does not trade in seed, if the variety is not registered, and if you remain within small quantities. And the small quantities are quite small. They're basically the quantities that are defined for research and experimentation. But it's this idea that the uh, informal seed exchanges between farmers and also the seed exchanges between seed savers, private individuals and gardeners will not be subject to the seed laws, okay? They will not be viewed as seed marketing. The latest uh, change and so the latest information that comes from national uh, member states on the subject comes from France. So this is quite a, it, it was a very long saga that ended in June 2020. So in the law that in French national law, so again, we're in a formal decision making process. So it went to the the. Uh, House of Representatives, I would say the Senate, etc. It's the law on transparency in the food chain, which modifies, it does not modify the seed laws, it modifies the rural code upon which the seed laws are based. So we're really defining the scope of the seed laws at very meta macro level. So we're talking about the rural code, where now it says that the assignment, supply or transfer, whether free of charge or against money uh, payment of varieties belonging to the public domain, so no intellectual property rights, to non-professional end users not aiming at the commercial exploitation of the variety will not be subject so to the EU seed laws according to the rural code, the French rural code. Okay, here the idea is basically is that it's not whether the person who, are, who is selling the seeds, the, the question that is important is not whether the person who is selling the seed is engaged in a commercial exploitation of variety, but the French law basically says that it is the quality of the end user of your purchaser, so the person uh, who purchases the seed that is important. So if that person, your user, your purchaser is not going to be engaged in commercial exploitation, then you should not be uh, subject to the EU seed marketing directives. You should also know that the European Commission has issued an opinion about this change of law because of a technical uh, decision-making process uh, after it was adopted by French though, by France, and uh, according to the EU authorities, this um, interpretation of the material scope of the seed laws is not in line with the EU seed directives because the actions are intended for the commercial exploitation of the variety. So the commission basically says that it does not matter if the end user, the purchaser is engaged in commercial exploitation or not. It 
what is important is what you as a marketer is doing, okay? What you are doing is more important than what the person you are selling it to is doing. So this is the different ways to look at the notion of seed marketing. Let's see where it, it leads us. But right now, so these are the discussions that are, are going on on the material scope of the EU directives themselves. Okay. Then you also have within the uh, EU seed law realm derogations that uh, pertain to the variety registration angle of it. So you have three of them that I'm going to talk about. The conservation and am so-called amateur varieties regime the temporary experiment on serial populations, and then the two new uh, criteria category that are created by the new organic regulation. Okay, first, so basically uh, this derogation comes from, so if you remember uh, from the beginning of this presentation, I, I told you that the the directives and the EU seed laws have been recast and codified in the year 2000, from, so, so from 2002 to 2008. And considering the changes at international uh, level, so the dawn of environmental law, so the Rio conventions, et cetera, and the United Nations uh, body of law that relate, relates to biodiversity, you, you have provisions that have been inserted in the directive that governs the common catalog on agricultural species and also on the vegetable uh, seeds where basically uh, the commission is given delegated powers to act you know and to establish a regime in the interest of conserving plant genetic resources okay and they basically say we the so the legislator says so, which is the council at the time with the European Parliament, but very less powers, to be honest. And then they have today. Then they basically say, we want you commission to come up with derogations on variety registration to allow uh, different types of varieties to enter into the market in a, an effort to conserve biodiversity. And this leads, so this led to the adoption of two commission directives. So we're not at council and parliament level, okay? This is led by the commission because it's a delegated power. And so the in 2008, the directive for agricultural species and then for vegetable species where you have conservation and amateur varieties. You also have this same delegation of powers uh, in the fodder directive. Uh, which has also the, 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 this power has been inserted in the 2000s. Uh, it's not, it wasn't present in the, in the 1960s. And that led to a commission directive in 20, so adopted in 2010, which basically allows the marketing of mixtures uh, for natural environment. So I'm not going to talk to you too much about fodder mixtures today, because the main point is really about this um, conservation variety regime. Uh, and the derogation to variety registration principles. Okay, so the two directives basically that uh, create this derogation regime uh, create a big conservation variety regime that is valid for agricultural plant species and for vegetable uh, seeds, vegetable species, and a so-called amateur uh, variety regime for vegetable uh, seeds. The principle is the same for both uh, types of derogations. The idea is to accept varieties into an official catalog of the member states and then at the EU level, even though these varieties do not conform to the strict DUS and VCU criteria. So even though the varieties are not distinct, uniform and stable, and they don't have a uh, value for cultivation and use in the sense of the formal EU seed marketing rules, we're gonna accept them into the catalog and you're gonna be able to market them. That's the general principle. For conservation varieties are defined in these commission directives 
as land races and varieties that have been tra traditionally cultivated in certain localities and regions and that are threatened by genetic erosion. Okay, so you have to show basically that these varieties are threatened by genetic erosion and then the idea is really to bring back and to maintain certain varieties by marketing them, by putting them in circulation. Whereas for amateur varieties here, it's basically uh, varieties with no intrinsic value for commercial crop production, but that are developed for growing under particular conditions. You could call them varieties with no intrinsic value, but I really do not like this term because it undervalues uh, these varieties. The amateur variety term does not fit me that much either, but it's the best we've got. It comes basically from the, the regime that inspired this entire ordeal. So the, the, it was the French uh, amateur variety regime that was uh, like easy market access, easier market access for amateur varieties. But yeah, the, the wording is quite unfortunate and the I think also shows a bit the way in which crop diversity is viewed and valued even in these directives. So the criteria to get access into uh, the catalog for both uh, conservation and amateur varieties is that in principle states are now allowed to adopt lighter criteria than the US. But the reference protocols are the same. Huh? So it's, we're, changing a bit the rules, but not too much, okay? But you states, we are, the commission, we are allowing you to change a bit the rules, but not too much, okay? You can just adopt different protocols. And the criteria for conservation varieties is really this notion of genetic erosion risk, whereas in the amateur vegetable seeds part is that it needs to be cultivated in particular pedoclimatic conditions and yet you need to show that it's uh, been developed for growing under particular conditions and you need to show which conditions that is. Okay, it could be organic, could be low input, could be mountainous areas, could be, uh, you, you can think of different conditions, I think, uh, for this uh, imagination can go wild. With regards to procedure, normally, normally, you shouldn't have any official examination if the authorities receive enough information with a description and the results of an official test, but you actually have countries where uh, this, you know, where official examination is required, Netherlands being one of them. The, then with regards to marketing, you have a lot of restrictions, especially for conservation varieties, in that the seed need to be produced and commercialized in the region of origin. And then you have quantitative restrictions over the, say, the sales, so you can't sell more than five to 200 hectares for vegetable seed. And for uh, agri, it's not more than 100 hectares per variety per member states. You, oh, uh, and for vegetable uh, amateur uh, seeds, it's about quantitative restrictions, not in terms of volume in general, or global volume, but you can only sell it in small packages. Uh, with regards to seed production rules, the, they basically apply the same way uh, for conservation varieties. So you can only sell certified basic or commercial seeds for agricultural plant species, and it can be standard or certified for vegetables. For amateur vegetable seeds, you need to sell standard uh, seed, which is obviously also easier as a you know, burden for uh, crop diversity operators or organic operators. Uh, with regards to label and packaging, uh, it doesn't change much from the EU seed marketing rules, the, 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 so the principle, the general ones. It is still um, the men, so uh, on cl enclosed packages or containers uh, bearing a sealing device that cannot be opened without damaging the sealing. Uh, and as for instance, for amateur vegetable seeds, you are only selling in small packages. You can use the supplier's label and you do not have to go the official label route. Okay, so a few examples. So I, I mentioned this just a few moments ago, a few mm, examples from implementation of these regimes at national level, because again, we're talking about commission directives. So it's not commission regulations. 
So they need to be transposed at national level. So you see a bit, a lot of difference between uh, countries. So in the Netherlands, the principle is the US testing in one growing cycle. So, but they, they adopt a bit their, um, their protocols and they say, we're not gonna check the resistance characteristics and we can actually even check VCU. So the value for cultivation and use for uh, cereal conservation varieties if uh, it has exceptional cultivation value. And the idea is that they're gonna do official post control every 10 years to check identity and varietal purity. In Austria, uh, the regime is much smoother, much easier, I think, to access. There is no official control for registration, especially uh, for uh, amateur vegetable varieties uh, and through a botanical description and other documentation that is uh, sent by the user who, is, who wishes to market the seeds through unofficial tests or literature, etc. It you can actually access the market and the region of origin where you have this very restrictive um, approach in conservation varieties is defined as the entire country and not a specific region. For instance, uh, in Belgium, uh, Belgium being the small country it is, you still have regions of origin that are determined by the federal regions. So Flanders will be a specific region of origin, for instance, not the entire Belgium which considerably restricts, obviously, the marketing opportunities of seeds. So uh, another example comes from Italy uh, here. Uh, so the regime has been used uh, quite well by uh, the crop diversity actors and farmers associations in the ground. And you have a specific derogations that allows um, the simplify uh, access for farmers you know, to, to sell seeds. Okay, in the national law and also in the decree. But however, you have a very restricted geographical area, even though you actually have, so a lot of varieties that are registered, they also um, have, because I think of the Italian specificity uh, in a way, in the way the, 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 the country uh, is proportioned in regions, you have very specific niche markets that are created. So the conservation varieties that are registered go through a specific route and a niche market for a product, for an end product at the end. A second big uh, derogation that exists with regards to variety registration within the EU seed uh, marketing rules uh, relates so the, to the so-called temporary experiment on cereal populations. Much like the regime on conservation and amateur varieties, here the Commission has acted again on a delegation of power that has existed for a much longer time than the one they've acted on for the conservation variety regime. Okay, so this delegation of power to the Commission to basically seek alternatives to the directives, so to the general principles, by organizing temporary experiments, it existed already in the 1960s. Also. So the legislator already saw that maybe my general principles are not fit for purpose for all purposes. And so they had already foreseen these temporary experiments, but it has only been used once. Okay, by the European Commission in the, you know, the past 60 years, but at least it exists. So you have a Commission decision dated as of 2014, which organizes a temporary experiment that allows the marketing of certain cereal seeds. And so the principle is that you, the users can derogate, or so member states can derogate to the in order to allow the marketing of populations of wheat, barley, oats, maize, okay? And why in the idea, so in the preamble of the commission decision, you have, uh, so the very different reasons that are listed, but the idea is that this, these populations uh, are identifiable by their history and their seeds are identified and verified more most of the, by their traceability. So you cannot have a variety registration because for variety registration, you only check the US and VCU at the moment of registration and you do not trace back the history of a specific population. 
and for seed uh, lot certification. So you, you're not really ensuring traceability. Okay, it's a much stricter also to the point regime. So that's why they organize a temporary experiment for so-called cross composite populations, which is a very specific type of population. I mean, the, the, the thing is defined in the commission decision, decision, but the idea is that it's a result of the simultaneous cultivation of five varieties and of intercrossings between these varieties, okay? Uh, the idea is that you do not have compulsory seed lot certification, so you do not have an official label, and you do not have a variety or population registration, but you can you, you only notify that you're marketing these populations to the authorities. This temporary experiment has only been picked up by the UK, Denmark, Italy, France, Germany, and the Netherlands to varying degrees of success. But it also meant so that it wasn't an even level playing field because since the temporary experiment was, for instance, just as an example, not picked up by the Spanish authorities, well, Spanish actors could not actually uh, market and put uh, these serial populations on the market just because this notification system did not exist in their country. Okay. Uh, third big, uh, very recent derogation on variety registration principles. It comes from the provisions on seeds marketing that are in the regulation, the new organic regulation, which will enter into force on the 1st of January, 2022. First of these two big um, provisions. So the, the provisions on seeds basically create two types of seeds and two different regimes and two types of derogations to the variety registration requirements. The first one is so-called organic heterogeneous material here, which is defined very clearly. So in the regulation as not a variety, but rather a plant grouping where you have common phenotypic characteristics, but also a high level or high degree of genetic and phenotypic diversity. That the seeds of organic heterogeneous material need to be produced according to the organic regulation. This is a requirement also of the so-called basic act of the regulation. And then a notification regime is already envisaged in the big regulation itself, which derogates to variety registration and certification requirements, and basically says there's no prior official control. It's only based on a dossier that needs to be sent to seed authorities. So the you have a general principle that is set by the basic act, as we call it in EU jargon. So the main regulation and the details of that notification and also marketing regime will be um, de so established in a delegated act, which will be then not a council and parliament regulation, but a commission regulation, which is not yet adopted, but I guess it will happen this year soon. It's almost close to finalization. And then a uh, second big type of derogation created by the organic regulation relates to organic varieties. So here we are not faced with plant groupings, we are faced with varieties. So in the sense of the CPVO regulation, so if you recall, the EU seed marketing rules do not define the term variety. That definition comes from the world of intellectual property rights, so from plant breeders' rights. And here, an organic variety is a variety in the sense of plant breeders' rights. But we have here a high degree of genetic and phenotypic diversity, which basically means that you cannot have access to the system because the system is not made with you in mind. And the variety needs to be a product of organic breeding and produced just like organic heterogeneous material according to the organic regulation. So there's a definition of organic breeding and organic breeding is, not, is only mentioned with organic varieties, not with organic heterogeneous material. And for that, the derogation is not complete. So it's not a completely new system like the organic heterogeneous material, but for organic varieties, the idea is that the commission services uh, so the seed authorities <laughs> will organize and launch um, a temporary experiment for 
the marketing of organic varieties, but just like the cereal populations. So it will not be an ad hoc regime, but it will be an experiment to see how the DOS and VCU protocols should be adapted to the needs of these specific varieties that have been bred. So with different uh, uh, conditions and also values and priorities in mind. And it will be launched by the European Commission. It won't be launched in all crop species, but the idea is that these varieties that do not fit the system entirely also find their way uh, to the market. Okay, then last type of big derogation you find in the EU seed marketing realm relates to the labeling and packaging rules. So these are not that uh, significant, uh, at, at least not as much significant as the derogations that relate to the material scope of the directives or the variety registration requirements, but still they can change, you know, it it's decreases the administrative burden that comes uh, with following strict labeling and packaging rules, which have basically been adopted with a very productivity oriented and uniformity oriented mindset in mind. So the idea is that if you're uh, selling small quantities of seeds in most of the directives, you have uh, an habilitation that is given to member states to set different requirements for the packaging, sealing and marking of uh, seed packages. Okay, so this example I give is from the vegetable uh, seed directives. And so you have this small CEC packaging uh, requirement. So if we're talking five kilos for legumes, 500 grams for onions, et cetera, so you have a specific volume that is in mind, you will be um, considered a small package. And there you don't have to put an official label, but rather use a supplier's label, which is obviously much less burdensome. Okay, so I'm coming back to the initial uh, picture I showed you on the different derogations. So the main, the largest derogations that exist obviously are the blue ones. So the general derogations on the material scope of the directives themselves. So either to ask yourself whether it's a regulated species or not and seed marketing. Okay, so the EU seed laws only apply to regulated species and to seed marketing, so the marketing of seed of regulated species. That's the widest general derogation that exists. Then you have more specific, but still wide reaching derogations on variety registration. The new complete exception of organic heterogeneous material, which means that you do not need to register a variety, but you're gonna notify a dossier in order to be able to market seeds from organic heterogeneous material. And then the more uh, classical, if you wish, uh, derogation, which is uh, ensuring easier or adapted access to the official catalog, so national and common catalog for cereal populations. So this is the temporary experiment for conservation and amateur varieties and uh, starting from 2022 or whenever, I hope the temporary experiment kicks in for organic varieties. And last, but not least either. So the derogations that exist on production and labeling rules. So this is the small packages, but I can also, we could also add the um, opportunity of having, uh, being able to market standard seed of vegetables, for instance, which is a, a, a huge, I think, lifting of burden uh, for crop diversity actors and which it also explains perhaps uh, why the, the difference of uh, actors you see in Europe when it comes to crop biodiversity between those who work with cereal seeds and with vegetable seed. That also comes, I think, uh, to a certain extent by this, uh, the, the, the existence of extremely restrictive seed certification rules uh, for cereal seed production. Uh, another way of looking at the derogations is starting from you as a crop diversity actor. So the first thing you need to ask is which species am I looking at? Or is that species regulated? Then if it is, which directive or which national law am I actually, how do I actually have to abide by? Then second thing you need to ask, what do you actually do with your seeds? 
okay? What are you doing with it? Is it a very non-commercial use outside of any kind of commercial exploitation, whether yourself or the person you are selling it to, okay? So uh, very classical exchange between farmers, so very, or a, a seed exchange fair, which where no money is exchanged. It's only about enthusiasts doing extremely small scale activities. Certain countries uh, have regarded this as seed marketing in the past, but honestly, with all uh, philosophical integrity, you can very hardly argue that such activities are actually commercial exploitation. Okay, it's not about marketing. If you're only exchanging seeds in small quantities within, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> of the framework of an exchange fair, right? Uh, are you doing research and selection? Okay, this can also fall within uh, certain um, exceptions. And if you're offering for sale, really, on the internet or in market and you have a stall and you're actually, you don't know the person really that's coming, you're not part of a network, you're not part of a diversity action system, etc. To whom are you selling it to? And in which context are you selling the seeds and propagating material? Because the answers to those questions will guide you in trying to answer whether what you're doing is actually subject to the EU seed marketing laws or not. And then, so you answer these general questions. I'm just going to give you uh, specific derogation examples from the two big, big families. So all my apologies for those working on fruit. But uh, so for agricultural plant species and for vegetables, you will have different derogations that you could use. So is my entry to the market possible through a conservation variety? Here you have... So derogations that apply on the notion of variety registration, as I said, so it's either a light DOS or sometimes only based on an official uh, description or sometimes even just a dossier with literature, et cetera, with history. Then uh, the, you have lighter labeling rules for conservation varieties. Know that there's no derogation for seed production uh, rules with regards to conservation variety. And obviously you also have all the restrictions, the quantitative and geographical restrictions that come with the marketing of seeds from conservation varieties. The second type of derogation that exists for agricultural plant species, it's the temporary experiment for cereal populations where you have three types. So this is a quite large scale <laughs> derogation where you do not need to register a variety, but it's more notification of the population. You have relaxed seed production rules, so it's not you do not need to certify seeds, which is just a huge deal for agricultural plant species. And then also lighter labeling rules, so no official seal, no official label, which also is uh, lifts a considerable burden from uh, crop diversity actors. And then also uh, another um, type of derogation that exists that's only about labeling is whether you're selling small quantities to the final user, so in small packages, et cetera, that you will only be um, exempt from labeling and packaging, uh, so the formal, more strict labeling and packaging rules, even though you still need to comply and abide by variety registration and seed production rules. For vegetable seeds, so, uh, the same goes uh, as the conservation varieties for agriculture, except that for amateur varieties, the regime is much more light touch. Uh, because also for seed production, you can ask, actually sell um, a standard seed and you do not have uh, the geographical um, restrictions that come. You only need to sell in small packages and there's no geographical restriction at all for the sale of amateur vegetable seeds. Uh, so the standard seed in general being a huge opportunity uh, for uh, crop diversity actors. So only post-marketing seed uh, production controls, not pre-marketing certification. And then the small packages, the articles on the small packages, which are basically then um, allowing you to sell uh, to, to market seeds with lighter labeling and packaging rules. And on that note, uh, so having viewed the general principles of the EU seed marketing laws and the directives and the also 
given examples of the national interpretation of these uh, directives, but also having looked at these directives through the angle of crop diversity actors. I thank you for your attention. And I'm looking forward to the questions. You can always contact me at the following address.